D. Recordigalair, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. What I want to do in this episode is to take a look at the reasons behind the outbreak of the War of Independence. Now, this is something that's been covered in depth multiple times over. Any book on the topic is going to have an introductory chapter or a few paragraphs doing just that. But what I want to do is to take a different approach to how this is usually covered. In general, what you get is a recap of the events before 1919, sometimes going back as far as the famine, but focusing mainly on the Home Rule Crisis, the First World War, the 1916 Rising, and the Conscription Crisis. Now these events in particular contribute massively to the outbreak of violence in 1919, but the question still stands, why? Why did these events lead to, and result in, the War of Independence? To answer that, I want to look at some of the modern theory on insurgent warfare. Since the end of the Second World War, a number of insurgencies have taken place worldwide, and today they have become a major topic of research. You have groups like the Rand Corporation, which studies insurgencies and advises policymakers on how they can be prevented or on how they can be aided. In his recent publication, Waging Insurgent Warfare, Lessons from the Viet Cong to the Islamic State, Seth G. Jones, who's a director at the Rand Corporation, outlined a number of factors that his research indicates are important for determining if an insurgency will break out in a region and how successful it will be. I'm going to talk through these factors and see if they were present in the run-up to the War of Independence and if they can be used to explain why it began. So the first question is, what exactly is an insurgency? For the purposes of his study, Jones defines an insurgency as a political and military campaign by a non-state group, or groups, to overthrow a regime or secede from a country. So, we have the political element, Sinn Féin, and we have the military element, the Irish Volunteers, who will later become the Irish Republican Army, as well as groups like Cumann Amman and Nifina Éireann. They are non-state actors, though Dáil Éireann declared Ireland to be an independent republic on the 21st of January 1919, this isn't recognised internationally. In the eyes of the world, Westminster is the legitimate legislative body in Ireland. Until the 11th of July 1921, these groups will agitate for international recognition of the Republic, usurp the legislative functions of Westminster, and fight the British forces in Ireland. So let's examine the factors that led to this. Jones identifies three key factors that impact the probability of an insurgency starting. Their presence doesn't guarantee that a rebellion will take place, but the more of them that are present in a region, the more likely it is that insurgent leaders will be able to take advantage of them. The three factors are local grievances, weak governance, and greed. The men and women who took up arms against the British regime in Ireland must have been aggrieved at something. Insurgent leaders can use these grievances to wage a political campaign whereby they denounce the current government, provide a counter-narrative, and explain how the insurgents will govern when they come to power. There are a near infinite amount of things that a population could be angry about, but the three major ones that impact the outbreak of a revolution are low per capita income, ethnic polarisation, and religious polarisation. So we start with low per capita income. In general, those suffering from poverty or from low income might hold the government responsible and be more willing to fight against them. People have less to lose and may be more inclined to join a rebellion, and low-income regions may suffer from a lack of opportunity for the populace, making it easier for an insurgent group to recruit members. The poverty suffered by the Irish people in the early 1900s is well documented. Immigration was rampant, and since the famine, the total population continued to decline census after census. Various land acts by which farmers were given loans to buy their land from the landlords had improved conditions for some in rural Ireland, but many continued to live on plots which reduced them to little more than subsistence living. Dublin contained some of the worst slums in Europe, and in 1916 had an infant mortality rate of 153 deaths per 1,000 births. The city was still suffering from the after-effects of the 1913 Dublin lockout, and many men joined up to fight in the First World War as it provided a stable income for their families. I said earlier that insurgent leaders could recruit from an impoverished population, and that they may be more willing to fight. So, how did the poor and low-income earners of Ireland interact with the revolution? In the 1918 general election, they voted overwhelmingly for Sinn Féin. There was a belief 
which Sinn Féin wasn't encouraging, but it wasn't discouraging either, that they would redistribute land if they came to power. There was still a great deal of land which hadn't been sold off under the Purchase Acts, and to decrease its price, it was being rented out to ranchers, large cattle farmers. This created a great deal of unrest and resentment amongst those with little or no property, and especially in the west of Ireland, where there were land seizures and attempts to drive cattle off of farms. To get an idea of how poverty impacted the military element, we can look at the quantitative research in The IRA at War, 1916-1923, by Peter Hart. Now, some of Hart's writings, including parts of The IRA at War, aren't without controversy. Many would describe parts of his work as biased, and I've seen some go so far as to describe him as a disgraced historian, for using terms like ethnic cleansing to describe the experience of Protestants in Ireland during the War of Independence. Hart sadly passed away following a car accident in 2010, so he can't defend himself, and he's definitely going to be referenced in future episodes, especially around the Kilmichael ambush. So for now, I just want to say that while criticism of some of his work is deserved, there is tremendous value in the research he carried out on the social structures of the IRA and his analysis of the causes of violence during the War of Independence and the Civil War. There has always been a traditional narrative that the War of Independence had a strong rural character and had been won by mountainy men, but Hart instead argues that, as he says, Throughout the revolution, the guerrillas were disproportionately skilled, trained, and urban. Farmers and their sons are underrepresented in the ranks of the IRA in proportion to their percentage of the total Irish population, while farm labourers, skilled and unskilled workers, are overrepresented. These labourers had little to no job security, and were often employed on a day-to-day basis. In Dublin, following the 1913 lockout, many of them were blacklisted and joined up in large numbers to fight in the First World War, as it was the only source of income available to them. In late 1917 and 1918, there was a great deal of unrest in the west of Ireland, caused not alone by ranchers renting land, but also by demands from labourers that large farms be broken up and distributed to them. These classes in particular would have had little money, little to no property and almost no opportunity to better themselves. Many would have emigrated to the United States or Britain, but during the First World War the British stopped emigration from Ireland to bolster its army and munitions production. Those who didn't join the army were instead ripe for politicisation. Hart also correlates IRA violence during the War of Independence and the Civil War with a number of local factors. For those without a statistics background, a strong correlation shows a relationship between two factors. It's not right to say that one causes the other, but there may be some underlying effect linking both of them. Correlations run from minus one to plus one. At these boundaries there is a strong relationship, while it is weak or non-existent the closer you get to zero. So we might think that how rural an area is would lead to more violence. Mountainous regions, difficult to traverse by vehicle, would allow the IRA and their superior local knowledge to strike quickly and often against British forces before retreating to safety. Hart finds, however, that there is only a 0.15 correlation between the wilderness of a county and total IRA violence between 1917 and 1923. The relationship is positive, but not very significant. Now, this might be down to early successes driving British forces out of these areas, or due to the ramp-up in violence in Dublin in late 1920 through to the Civil War. The strongest correlation with IRA violence is emigration. There is a positive 0.74 relationship between the emigration rate a county suffered from 1851 up to 1920 and the amount of IRA violence carried out in that county. The higher the emigration rate, the more violence. These would be regions worst hit by the famine, and their emigration of course is caused by poverty, low per capita income, and lack of opportunity, all factors Jones identified earlier as increasing the likelihood of an insurgency breaking out. There is also a positive 0.60 correlation between IRA violence and the agrarian violence a county saw during the period 1886 to 1891. These were the years covered by the plan of campaign and a renewed outbreak of the land war. The Chief Secretary of Ireland, Arthur Balfour, introduced a Coercion Act 
to counter the withholding of rent, and deployed battering rams for the RIC to use to demolish houses from which people were evicted. There are also correlations between IRA violence and other factors that could be taken as proxies for low per capita income, such as the size of a county's Irish-speaking population. There is also a slight negative correlation of 0.11 between violence and mean rateable valuation. The higher the average value of agricultural holdings in a county, so regions with more valuable land, the less IRA activity, but this is only a slight insignificant relationship. So we've seen quite a lot of evidence that poverty existed in the early 1900s, and that it had an effect on determining IRA activity during the War of Independence. But poverty had been a constant of Irish life for centuries, and would be for decades to come, and can't be the only factor in determining the outbreak of an insurrection. The other two types of local grievances that Jones spoke about are ethnic polarisation, or tension, and religious polarisation, or tension. I'm going to deal with both of these together, because in Ireland, ethnicity and religion can be very complex topics. We all know how wrong it sounds when foreign media, and a very cheesy episode of Captain Planet, describe the troubles in Northern Ireland as having been fought between Catholics and Protestants. Neat distinctions like that can't be imposed upon any of the conflicts in 20th century Ireland. Polarisation is used to describe how a person or a group identifies, and how they act based on their self-identified membership of an ethnic or religious group. Jones says that revolutions can break out where the population is polarised between an ethnicity connected to the government and another ethnicity opposed to them. There is an increased chance of insurgency in countries such as Ireland, which have a history of ethnic conflict. Religion also has a part to play. Insurgencies are more likely in countries with a large religious majority and a sizable minority of a different religion. The minority might feel excluded from the political process and from economic opportunity. This describes the status of Irish Roman Catholics within the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in the early 1900s. A full examination of ethnic and religious polarisation in Ireland would take us back to the Norman invasions, the English Reformation, and various plantations. It's also really hard to come up with neat ethnic distinctions in Ireland. Nationalist and Unionist is as close as I can get, but these are political definitions. Each might draw from a specific ethnicity, but I haven't been able to define them. So what I'm going to do is look at just a single event which caused considerable ethnic and religious tension in the run-up to the War of Independence, that being the Home Rule Crisis. The Irish Parliamentary Party had supported the Liberal Party in removing the power of veto held by the House of Lords and passing their budget. In return for this, a Home Rule Bill was put before the Commons in 1912. The Lords could now only delay this, and it looked certain that it would become law in 1914. This greatly alarmed the Unionist population in the northeast of Ireland, who, along with the Conservatives, viewed this as an attack on the Union itself. Unionists feared a Parliament in Dublin would take revenge for past ethnic grievances, like the Plantations, and believed that they would suffer religious persecution. Home rule is Rome rule. In response, they formed a 100,000 strong militia, and declared their intention to resist Home rule and form a provisional government in Ulster if it was introduced. Nationalists, in response to this, formed their own 100,000 strong militia to enforce Home Rule if needed. Ireland was on the verge of a civil war, exacerbated by ethnic and religious tensions. This crisis is rooted in the plantations of the 17th century, the Penal Laws, and the 1800 Act of Union, vastly beyond the topic of this episode, but we can see in it Jones's example of two distinct ethnic groups, one receiving preferential treatment from the government at the expense of the other. No effort is made to stop Unionists importing weapons for the Ulster Volunteers, even though they are threatening to use them against the government, and they are receiving strong support from the Conservative Party. Nationalists are continuously forced to accept compromises and delays to the bill, even after committing the National Volunteers to fight for Britain in the First World War. The meagre powers that the Home Rule Parliament would have had, which I've discussed in a previous episode, allow Sinn Féin to attack the Irish Parliamentary Party and present them as weak and ineffectual. 
Westminster's deference to the Unionists led many in Ireland to distrust politics and view military force and the complete removal of Britain as the only way to achieve fair government for Ireland. The Irish Volunteers, which formed to defend the interests of Nationalist Ireland, saw the majority of their members follow John Redmond and fight in the First World War as the National Volunteers. But what was left provided the insurgent leaders of the 1916 Rising and the War of Independence with a small but committed group of would-be revolutionaries. Decimated by arrests in the aftermath of the 1916 Rising, the Irish Volunteers were reorganised in 1917, and around August of 1919 rebranded as the Irish Republican Army. So we can see that the three major local grievances pointed to in waging insurgent warfare, those being low per capita income, ethnic tensions and religious tensions, were present in Ireland in the early 1900s and presented material for Sinn Féin and the Irish Volunteers to create a counter-narrative. They could highlight these grievances, lay the blame at the feet of the British establishment, aided by an ineffectual Irish parliamentary party, and argue that the solution to these was the achievement of an Irish Republic. So the insurgent leaders have a disaffected population from which to recruit, but this doesn't in itself guarantee that an insurrection will begin. Many countries have a population suffering from these same conditions, but the populace is held in check by a strong government. So the next factor we're going to look at is its opposite, weak governance. Jones gives an extensive description of governance, which he says covers the set of institutions by which authority in a country is exercised. He quotes the German sociologist Max Weber, who defined a state as a human community that successfully claims the monopoly on the legitimate use of physical violence. So the government of a state creates institutions and laws to exercise and maintain its authority. One of these institutions is a police force, which enforces the law through the legitimate use of physical violence. They can restrain and incarcerate, against their will, those members of the state who violate its laws. Strong governance means that the state is able to provide for the people living under it, who often contribute the resources required to maintain the state institutions. The state is able to limit their grievances and provide basic services to them. Failing this, then the state is able to maintain a strong police force, a military, and possibly even a secret police. Strong governance means the people have either little reason or little opportunity to rebel against the state. Weak governance, on the other hand, means that state institutions fail to provide for the people, causing widespread grievances. This can lead to a legitimacy crisis, whereby the authority of the state institutions is challenged, possibly leading to an insurrection against the regime. A strong state will be able to deploy its security forces to suppress dissent and preserve its power, but where this is lacking, the insurgency can build enough momentum to achieve some or all of its objectives. So, that's all very theoretical, but how does it apply to Ireland? State institutions in Ireland, such as Dublin Castle, the Royal Irish Constabulary, and specific Irish legislation passed at Westminster, not alone fail to provide for the majority of the Irish population, but often actively persecuted them. Again, we can go back to the penal laws, the economic conditions that led to and exacerbated the famine, and the various land wars. By 1912, however, it looked like the Land Purchase Acts and the promise of home rule had done a lot to counter the major grievances of the Irish people, there are a number of examples of weak governance by the British in the run-up to the War of Independence that benefit Sinn Féin and the Irish Volunteers in staging an insurrection. The first is the Home Rule Crisis and their response to it. When he made the promise of Home Rule for Ireland, Herbert Asquith, the Liberal Prime Minister, had given no thought to how the Unionist people would react to this. When they formed a militia to resist British legislation and proclaim a provisional government, basically an act of treason, not alone did the British administration not move against this threat to their power, but instead turned a blind eye as they imported weapons from Germany and trained under British army officers. The Corra Mutiny was another example of weak governance, where army officers threatened to resign if ordered to move against the Ulster Volunteers, and commitments were made that force would not be used to crush opposition to Home Rule. This encouraged the Nationalists to form the Irish Volunteers, 
who after a split in 1914 would go on to fight the 1916 Rising and the War of Independence. In Waging Insurgent Warfare, Jones argues that weak governance can result in what is called a security dilemma, which he describes as a situation in which each side's efforts to increase its own security inadvertently threatens the other. The Home Rule Crisis also acts as a type of security dilemma, I think. The Unionists feel threatened by Home Rule and try to secure their position in the Union by forming a militia. This threatens the Nationalists' aspiration for Home Rule and so they form a militia in response. Weak governance has failed to take Unionist fears into consideration and when they begin arming themselves it fails to stop or challenge them. Nationalists feel threatened by both the Ulster Volunteers and the lack of action against them, and so move to increase their own security. It's often glossed over just how close to civil war Ireland came at this time. We can also look at weak governance in a number of other actions after this, like refusing to allow Redmond's National Volunteers to form their own units or have their own officers, and Britain's handling of the 1916 Rising. But the other major issue I want to discuss is the conscription crisis. The United Kingdom was in desperate need of troops after initial German success in the 1918 Spring Offensive, and so put forward the idea of imposing conscription in Ireland, which had been exempt in the past. There was no thought given to how this would be received in Ireland, where it presents Sinn Féin with a chance to lead resistance to its implementation. There are considerable demonstrations against conscription, but the British convince themselves that if they can remove the Sinn Féin leadership, the country will calm down. A mass-scale roundup is attempted on the 17th of May, which instead presents Sinn Féin with a propaganda coup. Belief that the German plot under which the roundup was carried out was fabricated, and the continued refusal to bring any of those arrested to trial, causes what sociologist Jürgen Habermas would describe as a legitimacy crisis. At the 1918 general election in November, the people vote for a party which refuses to recognise the legitimacy of the state and instead establishes a separate parliament and declares an independent republic. They will establish a counter-state government with ministries such as finance, labour, and fine arts, as well as a court system, and the IRA will claim for themselves the legitimate use of physical violence. A legitimacy crisis of this scale is the result of weak governance, and it was exacerbated in this case by the extension of the electorate. The 1918 general election is the first ever in which a majority of the population is able to vote, and the electorate had almost trebled since the previous vote in 1910. Weak governance made it difficult for these new voters to associate themselves with the existing system. On top of all this, Britain failed to respond adequately to initial insurgent attacks in 1919. The IRA was able to challenge the RIC and carried out a number of ambushes and assassinations, undermining the state's ability to enforce the law and securing further support. In September, Britain began a policy of reprisals and in March of 1920 deployed the Black and Tans, both of which alienated the people further. These measures allowed the IRA to grow slowly and expand the scope of their attacks. I've spoken about how local grievances and weak governance allowed Sinn Féin and the IRA to gain support and to recruit members. By support what I mean is people who would vote for Sinn Féin, provide food and shelter to the IRA, important but low-level support like that. It doesn't always mean that they took an active role in the war, very few people did. In the 1940s, there were about 15,000 service medals issued to those who saw active service in the War of Independence, and a further 50,000 were issued to members of Comunamán, Nifina Éireann, and members of the IRA, whose service is not deemed to be active military service. The numbers fighting are small, but they cannot survive without the support of the population at large, especially in a guerrilla war. We'll see later during the Civil War that the anti-treaty side has only limited support in much of the country and often alienates the population with their actions, and we'll see how that contributed to their defeat. The last factor Jones talks about in Waging Insurgent Warfare is greed. Greed covers a lot of different areas, but it is mainly the presence of resources or funding that can be used to start and wage an insurgency. Insurgents need weapons, they might need to pay those fighting and finance operations like propaganda. 
This can be easier in countries that have lootable resources, like gold or oil reserves, where these are absent and insurgency might need to requisition supplies from the local population or impose taxes. During the War of Independence, a number of methods were used to finance the operations of both the Dáil and the Irish Republican Army. Loans were subscribed to in Ireland and in the United States, local support was depended upon for food and shelter, and weapons were taken in raids on RIC barracks or on the homes of wealthy Southern Unionists. Contributions were solicited and imposed on farmers and business owners. Financing the War of Independence was not easy, and there was great difficulty, especially, in getting money for weapons. While extensive sums of money was raised in America, it was difficult to get this into Ireland. Due to the slow pace at which the War of Independence escalated through 1919, there was enough funding and material in place to get it started, but these began to run out. When we come to the reasons for the truce in 1921, and some of the reasons put forward for signing and supporting the treaty, we'll examine if the resources were still in place that would have allowed the conflict to continue. One final issue to look at is politicisation. Unlike previous revolts, such as the 1916 Rising, there was a concentrated period of politicisation before the War of Independence. For two years beforehand, Sinn Féin had been fighting by-elections, highlighting government failures, and pushing the concept of a republic. A lot of their popularity was due to their links to 1916, and they were able to build upon this and draw members to both the party and to the Irish volunteers. Now, Sinn Féin wasn't agitating for an armed insurrection. Many in the party had abandoned the idea, and their goal was to achieve a political solution. Some within the Irish volunteers, however, had a different idea. There were those who distrusted politics and indeed feared leaving matters in the hands of Dáil Éireann. I'll look into this in more detail when we come to the solo headbag ambush and the opening of Dáil Éireann, but the politicisation campaign and the results of the 1918 general election gave both Sinn Féin and the Irish Volunteers, soon to become the Army of the Republic, an aura of legitimacy which aided them massively as Britain moved to suppress the Dáil and deployed the Black and Tans to enforce their authority. We've seen that two of the three major factors put forward as increasing the probability of an insurgency, local grievances and weak governance, were present in Ireland and had an impact on the outbreak of the War of Independence. Now, there's nothing new here. We've covered the same topics as any other explanation of what led to the War of Independence, but I think it's been interesting to examine them in the light of modern research and to get an idea of why these events contributed to the outbreak of violence. This has been a very superficial look at some of the theories put forward in waging insurgent warfare, but I think they have value in at least presenting a different narrative as to why the War of Independence started, devoid of any of the emotionalism which is usually involved. We can argue that historically, the Irish population had been maintained in a state of low income with limited economic opportunity other than emigration. Continued weak governance by the British state in the decade before the War of Independence presented charismatic insurgent leaders with an opportunity to politicise a large, disaffected population, caused a legitimacy crisis culminating in the results of the 1918 general election, and win early guerrilla victories which further undermined the state. A potential reason for the conflict ending in 1921 was a lack of resources with which to continue, the third factor Jones spoke about which we'll examine later. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, please make sure to like it and to follow the channel. There will be an episode coming on the general election, and then a few around the anniversary of the opening of Dáil Éireann and the solo headbag ambush. Make sure to follow the channel on Twitter as well, the link is in the description. I'm tweeting recaps of Irish affairs at the House of Commons 100 years ago. It's a thrill, I assure you. Accorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of all.